11 o'clock last night. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. So in your bulletin is the message outline. If you'll go ahead and get that, then you can follow along point by point. Yeah, and you'll have all the scriptures. Let's say Philippians 127 says. We are looking at the church as the community of believers. We're looking at the power of the church as a community of believers. And there's really two things that we're wanting to do or accomplish in this series based on Philippians 1.27. Number one is we want to deepen our sense of community within the church. And number two, we want to reach out to the community around our church family. And after service today, we're going to be having our first meeting and talking about our outreach ministry. You have information on it in your bulletin. It says this in Philippians 1.27, that you are standing side by side with one strong purpose to tell the good news. I would like for you to circle standing side by side and then circle tell the good news. We are looking at ways that we can do God's work together in partnership with each other. Because together we're going to get more done than individually. You have probably seen pictures of Mother Teresa who died in 1997. Maybe you've seen one of the iconic pictures of her standing in front of an orphanage, maybe in Calcutta or somewhere else. And you look at the picture and you kind of think that uh, Mother Teresa did it all alone. Did you know that she had an army of helpers? And that people were literally falling over themselves to be able to work with her and say they were with Mother Teresa. She did not do anything by herself. She did everything and accomplished everything in the context of community. In Philippians 1.5, it says this in the New Living Translation. I love the way they put this. You have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. So we're going to take a look at seven ways we can partner with each other to share God's love and God's Word. But before we can partner, we have to decide that we're going to be unselfish and be concerned about people's eternal destiny. And I'll mention that a little bit later in the message. So we're going to call these partnership principles. Number one is be ready to pray together. Number one, this is one because it is a priority, is be ready to pray together. And one of the most effective ways we can do this as a community is in our small group. And so in my small group, we started something last week and I'll be sharing this with the other ministry leaders. I'll be scanning the material and sending it to you. Some of you have already received physical copies. But at the beginning of each class is we have a, a prayer list. And we just pass the prayer list around for what you would like for us to pray for today in this class. And then I circulated another piece of paper to get everybody's emails in the group. So I said, during the week, I'm going to email these names to you and we're going to pray about them. And so we want good communication between us. So prayer is something that can be very effectively done in our small groups. Now we can't force anybody to love God. But we can pray for them and pray for each other. And what are we supposed to be praying for? This is Colossians 4.3. It says, pray for us that God will give us an opportunity to tell people his message. Isn't that good? So we are to be praying that God will give us opportunities individually and collectively to share his word. 
When you start praying for opportunities, you're going to start seeing opportunities everywhere. It's just like when you buy a silver car, all of a sudden you start seeing silver cars everywhere. They're everywhere. Now, it, it's not that there weren't any silver cars. It's just that your mind had no reason to focus. But now that you have one, whoo, everybody has a silver car. It's that way with spiritual opportunities. When we start looking for them, we're going to see them on a daily basis. And so, number one is be ready to pray together. Partnership principle number two. Find common interest with those in your small group and outside the church. Look for some common interest. Before you can reach anybody, you have to establish a relationship with them. So what are some things that you like to do? What are some things that your group likes to do? Fish, golf, shop, shop, football, <laughs> Baseball, what are some things that you can plan to do with a co-worker or a neighbor individually or as a part of your small group? Now, I know we have a couple of guys here, maybe some girls too, who do the alligator hunting. I think it's on a lottery system, so you may not get a ticket to get an alligator every year. But I, you know, I don't know that the first thing you're going to ask your neighbor to do, would you like to go alligator hunting with me? You know, wrestling a 12-foot alligator north of the causeway. I, I don't know. Maybe you have the kind of neighbor that would be just the thing to do. But there are things that we can do and incorporate other people. Look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23. Mark read it a few moments ago, but I don't think you can overread this passage. I don't think you can overread the Bible. It says, whatever a person is like, whatever they're like, people are different, if you haven't noticed. Not only on the outside, but on the inside, apparently God loves variety. Have look at you, and see, God has a sense of humor too sometimes. <laughs> whatever a person is like, watch this. I try to find common ground with him so that Sometime we're going to have a series on the so that's of the Bible. <laughs> he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. Right. He said, I try to find common ground. In the book of Acts 17, Paul, who was a New Testament Christian, allowed himself to be placed under a Jewish vow, if for nothing else, to show that he still respected Jewish traditions. Maybe he did it to win South and East the Jews, the Jew to Christ. But he found some common ground. I do this, verse 23, to get the gospel to them. And also for the blessing I myself receive when I see them come to Christ. So two is find common interest. And then partnership principle number three is we want to reach out in love. Now we're familiar with the first commandment, the greatest commandment, love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. Mark adds all of your strength. The second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. So why are we interested on focusing on people around us and not just ourselves? We could just focus on ourselves. So why do we have this interest on people outside of our fellowship. Number one, people without Jesus are lost eternally. That's just what the Bible says. In Romans 3.23, <laughs> it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that includes the president and the pope and you and me and everyone else in the world. And so we tell people the good news that Jesus Christ came to the earth, He died for their sins, and that when you make the decision to be baptized, your sins can be forgiven. We are not trying to give anybody rabies. I don't know if human beings can give rabies, but we're not trying to. We're not trying to spread some kind of a deadly plague or disease. We are actually trying to give people 
the cure for the spiritual disease that is in the world called sin. And right in the middle of the word sin is what letter? I. Um, number two. I owe God for the grace and forgiveness He's showing me. I think you and I owe God something for what we have had the privilege of responding to and being a part of. Think about this. There are approximately 7 billion, 300 million people in the world. 3 billion of those 7 million people are in what is classified as unreached people groups. That means they have no access to God's plan of salvation. They couldn't become a Christian if they wanted to because they wouldn't even know what to do. Now, no one's underestimating God's power to send someone. But think about how you and I are so privileged. Just think about how we have the Word of God at our fingertips. And think about how we have 24-7 access to it. Very incredible. We're very, very blessed. And then three, I am to love my neighbor as I love myself. We do a pretty good job of loving ourselves. You know, taking care of ourselves. Do a pretty good job of that. This is 1 Corinthians 5.12. The new century version. Which is not a new century anymore. So they may have to... Uh, <coughs> change this and maybe say the new uh, 22nd century version or something. Mm -hmm. It says this, It is not my business to judge those who are not part of the church. God will judge them. When I see somebody who is not a believer acting in a sinful way, I don't get upset about it. I don't lose my mind over it. I don't judge them. Because I have been called to help them and to love them and give them the opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so they can have the power to make the changes they need to make. Now, never expect a believer, a non-believer, to act like a believer until they are. Sometimes we expect non-believers to act like believers. I think that's asking a little much. Now you can offer to pray for them. What I've discovered is that most people do not reject prayer. Even agnostics and atheists may say something like, yeah, go ahead, it can't hurt anything. I need all the help I can get. So reach out in love. Then partnership principle number four is share your personal spiritual testimony. On Wednesday nights, last Wednesday night, we started the series, How to Be a World-Class Christian. Right? We have world-class hotels and world-class athletes, world-class cars. <laughs> Maybe we ought to take a look at what is a world-class Christian. So we want to share your personal testimony. Two weeks from now, not this coming Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, we're going to talk about how to put together a personal, spiritual testimony and what it needs to include. I just happened to bring mine. Let me find it here in my notes. Okay, I'm not going to read it. So just take a deep breath. You've heard it before. Mine is single space, one page. Okay, one page. There's, this is the biblical principle. 1 Peter 2, 9, and I love it, I love it in the message paraphrase. You are God's instruments to do His work and speak out for Him. Watch this. To tell others of the night and day difference He made to you. The night and day difference He has made to you. The most effective way to let other people know about how God can do great things in their lives is to tell them what great things he has done in your life. People can argue with your theology, but they don't normally argue with your personal experiences. I mean, if you come up to me and say, I fell off of a cliff and the angel swooped down under me and I landed safely, fine, I'm just glad you're here. Fine. 
Now, if you say to somebody, the Bible teaches that angels will save everyone who falls off a cliff, now you might get into a theological discussion on that. But keep your personal testimony to three minutes or less. I can do this in two and a half minutes. Keep it to three minutes or less. And here's the reason why. Don't talk to somebody for 15 minutes and you're only up to age five. <laughs> no one's going to listen. You can be a witness for Jesus Christ. Now, did I use the word I? I said nothing about an I witness. I am not suggesting that anyone is going to be an I witness like the apostles who saw the physical miracles of Jesus. I am using witness as a verb, which means, this is straight from the dictionary, Merriam Webster, to give evidence of or to testify on behalf of something you believe to be true. You can say to someone, this is how the Lord has made a night and day difference in my life. And if you want to practice your personal testimony, I'm thinking in the small group that I have, that we may have one person a week. If someone just wants to volunteer, just to share it and, and get some practice. People, listen to how the Lord has changed you. More than they're going to listen to seven points in a message. Now later they'll come to appreciate those beautiful seven points in a message. <laughs> now this is Psalm 66, 16. This is way, way, way back when. All of you who fear God, come and listen. And I will tell you what He has done for me. So your personal testimony is so far, so far. Partnership principle number five is build friendships in and out of the church. Build friendships in and out of the church. It's a principle that sounds easy, but it gets to be more difficult the longer you're a believer because the longer you're a believer, the less you hang out with non-believers. So it, it's easy to understand. It's somewhat of a challenge to continue to do this. We want to build bridges between our hearts and non-believers' hearts so that Jesus can walk across the bridge. So in Romans 12, 16, I said earlier in the introduction that if we're going to reach out, the first thing is, is that we have to become unselfish and that we have to be concerned about other people's eternal destiny. Well, this was the passage I was alluding to. I'm going to read it. It says, be friendly with everyone. Don't be proud and feel that you are smarter than others. And you may be. Make friends with ordinary people. I love that. I love that. Just ordinary people. One of the best ways to make friends is by having a party or a social activity. I am here to tell you that Jesus did a lot of his ministry at parties. In fact, so much so that the people, mainly the religious elite, they called Jesus a party animal. <laughs> that old party animal. Now, they didn't use the term party animal. They used the term drunk and glutton, which is probably worse than party animal. This is what they said. This is Jesus, the guy who had no sin. The Son of Man feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners. But watch this. The worst kind. Let me tell you, there are sinners and there are sinners. <laughs> the people I'm looking at out here, yeah, you're, you're, you're sinners. Out there, sinners. <laughs> so there's sinners and then there's the worst kind of sinners. That wouldn't be us. <laughs> So this is Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. Why did Jesus go to these places? I'm going to tell you. Because it's where the people were. He wanted to share God's love with. 
So we want to look at this and find the eternal principle, the timeless principle that transcends the first century and apply it to our lives. Maybe there's something you can do in your lunchroom or your break room that would be appropriate. I'm not asking you to go out and break some kind of a company policy. I think within parameters and rules and limits, I think you can find ways to share God's word and be wise like a serpent, okay? I do not believe God has called us to be isolationists. And here's how it works. I don't think churches do it on purpose necessarily. But here's how it kind of happens. We're just going to be a part of our church culture and our school culture and we're not going to let anybody else in. And what happens is a church or a group of religious people, they isolate themselves and they end up becoming an island separated by a culture of secular atheism. And we don't want that to happen. This is when the church becomes irrelevant. We don't want to become irrelevant. We don't want to become so out of touch that you know, we don't know anything that's going on in the world except in our protected group. On the other hand, so that's one, that's one extreme, isolationist. We don't want to do that. On the other extreme, we don't want to become imitators either. We don't want to imitate the world and take on all of the world's values and start trash talking each other like Kim Kardashian was trash talking Taylor Swift. She was, uh, that happened a couple of weeks ago, according to TMZ. I was there just last night. <laughs> Reading something. Kim Kardashian got all trash talking on Taylor Swift. The Bible says that we are to be the salt of the earth. Get this. Salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now what that says in one sentence is that you and I have the responsibility to penetrate society with God's goodness. And we can be in this world without loving the evil aspects of it. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, God's gift, does not want you to be afraid of people but to be wise and strong and love them and enjoy being with them. God doesn't want us to be afraid of people. He wants us to be wise and strong and love them and enjoy being with them. So you can invite a friend to your small group or to worship service. Go, I don't know of anybody to invite. According to research from Lifeway, 57% of people said that they would go to church if they were invited. Now, I'm like you. I don't necessarily buy into all of these surveys and polls. And, and they could be like, so let's just say the 50%, 57% is way off, and it's just 25%. <coughs> That's still pretty significant. Number six. So we want to build relationships in and out of the church. Partnership number six. Partnership principle. Expect God to act. Expect God to act. I just want to remind you that God works in people's hearts when we expect Him to. So in Matthew 9, 29, this is Jesus, there's a couple of blind people there. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, it will be done to you. Now, I don't believe this verse is teaching a health and wealth gospel that says, The greater your faith, the greater your physical prosperity. So the people in this congregation with the greatest faith are those who have the most assets. I don't believe that. 
I don't believe this verse is saying that God will give you whatever you want. What it does say is this. In order for God to work, we have to have a high expectation because if we don't expect anything to change, nothing will change. It says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. Sometimes I think the problem is that we believe the wrong things move God. It doesn't say according to your complaining. It doesn't say according to your gossip. It doesn't say according to your wishful thinking. Doesn't say any of those things move God. According to your faith. So I'd like to share with you this story about Charles Spurgeon. And I put on here. Yeah, I put on confirmed because I personally haven't confirmed it. Ministers have told it for many years, but that doesn't mean it's true. Discovered a lot of things that we've been sharing for years weren't true once we got the internet. <laughs> Yeah. A long time ago, all you had were Bartlett's book of quotes. Lord Kelvin said in 1856 in England, and the, and the audience is, Lord Kelvin, 1856, who cares? <laughs> but Charles Spurgeon was real. He was born in 1834, died sometime in the 1890s. He was a minister in London at the Metropolitan Tabernacle Church. Probably was the world's number one best known person of that era, kind of like Billy Graham was a generation or two ago. So a young man came up to Charles Spurgeon and he said, Mr. Spurgeon, it's just, man, it's like every time you speak, dozens of people respond. It's amazing. But when I speak, no one responds. And Spurgeon said, oh, young man, come on. Get real, man. You don't think, really think, really believe that every time you speak, somebody is going to respond, do you? He said, the young man said, no, of course not. Spurgeon said, that's exactly the problem. <laughs> we want to thank God in advance for what he's going to do this year. Amen. Just thank him. Thank him ahead of time. That's the faith that God uses to change lives. Now, most people aren't going to come to Jesus the first time they hear the good news, so we want to give them time to consider all of the facts. Don't give up on anybody. Keep praying in expectation. We must pray in expectation. That's what I think the application is of according to your faith that will be done to you. I love this story of the paralyzed guy <clears throat> as it's told in Luke's account. Jesus is speaking in a house and it's standing room only. And outside there's this sure. guy <laughs> who's paralyzed and he has some friends. And his friends have brought him so Jesus can heal him. But they can't get to Jesus because of the crack. And so with a little bit of American ingenuity and creativity, they go up to the top of the roof, maybe it was thatch, or maybe it was individual tiles, and they removed them and made a big hole, lowered the guy right in front of Jesus while he's speaking. You have to imagine this. And I love Luke 5.20. Watch this. When Jesus saw... The paralyzed man's great faith. No, nope, doesn't say that. When he saw their faith, I don't know if the paralyzed guy had any faith or not. We're not told anything about him other than he was paralyzed. But when Jesus saw the faith of his friends, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And then he healed. Sometimes, you and I have to believe that God is going to act on behalf of other people. We have to believe that our prayers for spiritual growth and outreach, that He's going to answer those prayers in other people. Just as these guys prayed and Jesus saw, saw, he saw their faith and He healed someone else. 
Jesus said that we have to be like a child in order to in enter the kingdom. Now what does that mean? It means love God with childlike simplicity and sincerity. Trust God, trust Jesus with simple faith, and share Jesus with simple enthusiasm. That's what's needed. This is why the Bible says in Mark 12 that the common people heard glad Jesus gladly. It didn't say anything about the elite. The common people heard Him gladly. So expect God to act. And then number seven, partnership principle number seven, is represent Christ with your life. Represent Christ with your life. As you are doing, continue to do what you're doing. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do or say, let it be as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Boy, that would help relationships a whole lot. I was just thinking, you know, some of these are they're like good relationship principles, right? How would this work in marriage? All the while giving thanks through Him to God the Father. So we need to communicate and demonstrate God's Word. Share it with your mouth. Live it with your life. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Do all you can do, do all you can to live a peaceful life. Take care of your own business. Well, what that says generally is mind your own business. You know, I mean, to a point, you don't want to become so invasive that you know, people say, hey, they run every time they see you. Take care of your own business and do your own work. Then, then, people who are not believers will respect you. You are God's representative on earth. And He has put people in your life so that you can share spiritual truths with them. God is not going to send anybody an email. I'm here to say you are God's email. You are the message that He is sending out to people. You're it. You carry the message. So in Strasbourg, Germany, let's see if we have, okay. Strasbourg, Germany, there is a statue of Jesus in front of a church building. And I don't know how well you can see it, but it's uh, the arms of Jesus are outstretched. Well, there are no hands. The hands are missing. During the bombings of World War II, when the Allied bombers were over Germany, they were bombing. Of course, the bombs weren't accurate then, like they are now. They just dropped them out of the hatch. And one bomb severed a beam, and the beam fell, and it cut off Jesus' hands. It just, boom, oh, his hands were missing. So after the war, there was this sculptor, and he said, oh, I will, I'll give Jesus new hands. I'll replace the hands. And the church leadership thought about it and they said, no, we're just going to leave it the way that it is because this is a great illustration of how Jesus has no hands but our hands. Doesn't happen at all. His arms are outstretched. But the only hands he has are your hands. Only feet he has are your feet. Only ears he has are yours. Only mouth he has is your mouth. That's it. We are his representatives. So I want to challenge you to get into a small group or uh, invite someone to a small group or to worship service. I would like for us to have 30 more people here by the end of the year. I'm trying to be you know, a little bit of faith, but reasonable too. Maybe 10, 20. 30. I would love to see this congregation grow just as much as you want to see it grow. And so we're going to thank the Lord ahead of time for what He's going to do and for the ways that He's going to bless our efforts individually and as a congregation. So I wrote a little prayer and I write these out for you sometimes because then you can <laughs> adapt it to your own use. Father, you have given us a mission in the world to share your good news and your love with other people. It's great. We don't have to do it alone. 
We realize that you've put specific people in our lives because you want us to share your love and your word with them. We want to accept that mission and we expect your work to be seen visibly this year. We want you to use us. Help us to be concerned about the people around us who don't know you. We want to partner with our small groups and Bible classes, realizing that no one is going to know you unless we show them. No situation is hopeless, and nobody is beyond the reach of your love. In faith, we're asking you to bless us uh, well, let me go back. We're asking you to bless our individual and collective efforts so that by the end of the year, 30 more people, maybe 20 people, maybe whatever, can call you Father and Port City, their church home. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to encourage us to continue to have the strong faith we have possessed in the past. I believe the Lord is going to work through us and that there's going to be visible results. So I'm excited about the possibility. And it's beautiful to be able to think of myself as a partner with you in the gospel. David is going to lead us in our invitation hymn. And if you have a particular need, please let us know what it is while we stand and sing. <laughs> 